we're back in Genesis and doing a road trip through the Bible. This is the journey through Genesis. And it's just good to go back over and over again through the scriptures. We just made it through Revelation like a month ago. Now we're back in Genesis. We're going to go back all the way through from Genesis to Revelation again. And this should close out the book of Genesis, the journey through Genesis. And then I'm going to start the expedition through Exodus and go through Exodus. And each year or every two years that you do this, however long it takes you, you're always a different person when you make it back around. You've always grown a little bit. You've grown in the Lord a little bit. You've gotten a year or two older. You've gotten some wisdom and experience under your belt, hopefully. And you're going to see something in the scriptures that you didn't see the last time or the first time. And we can get a little bit more detailed each time. Add some more nuggets of truth in there each time. And so you do this ten times you're really going to have a whole lot to show somebody about each book of the Bible. But I believe we made it to chapter 36. And in Genesis chapter 36, you've got it talking about Esau's descendants. And this is one of those chapters that people hate to read because it's got tons of names in it. But think about it like this. God is giving you Esau's descendants. And when you go to a, a new workplace, right? So you go to a new workplace or a new church. What's one of the first things people ask you or me? Just the other day it happened to me where someone said, you know, what's your dad's name? Who was your mother? Or, oh, that's your mother? Oh, so so-and-so is your uncle. You see, people are interested in people and people are interested in families and the more you get into the Bible and into the Bible characters, the more interested you will be in who their dad is. The more interested you'll be in who Esau's descendants are. It blows my mind how that Noah is just Nimrod's great-grandfather. Or how Enoch and Methuselah are Noah's grandpas. Uh, get into the Bible characters Take some interest in the Bible characters and make them your friends. Make them more than just characters you read about. But read the Bible so much that these Bible characters become your friends. And then you will want to get more acquainted with them. And you're going to want to find out who their dad is. Who their descendants is. You're going to want to know their family tree, trees. Who came before them? Who came after them? Uh, which one of them lived? The same time as the other. I'm interested in all that stuff now. When I first started reading the Bible, it was a, a really a, a big boring task to read this long group of names because I'm just reading about people that I didn't really know. But the more you read the Bible, familiarize yourself with these people, become friends with Noah and Moses and Jacob and Abraham and Isaac, and you're going to want to know who their daddies are who their sons are, who their mothers are. You know, and some names in these chapters that used to be hard, I just really like saying now. You know, in Genesis 36, 41 through 42, it says, Duke Aholibama, Duke Elah, Duke Pinon, Duke Kenaz, Duke Teman, Duke Mibzar. <laughs> Crazy names, and maybe you can't even pronounce these names. One thing you can do to help you pronounce the names, and I, I can't pronounce them all myself. I've, I've tried to get the Alexander Scorby audio Bible. I've got a audio Bible by Ruckman. I've got different dramatized audio Bibles, and some of them say the names differently even on those. But, I mean, you just take whichever one you feel like says it best, I guess. And just try your best to sound them out and read them. And that's how you can go through chapters like Genesis 36. Think about it like I just said. And then you go to Genesis 37. 
uh, Jacob's son, Joseph. Now you get into the story of Joseph, which is a great story, and it's it's a long story. I mean, it's going to go from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50, with the exception of one chapter, all about Joseph. Really important character because he's the greatest type of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So Jacob's son Joseph is sold by his brothers as a slave. And see, this is done by his own brothers selling him. They're envious of him because he's a daddy's boy. And Joseph made, or Jacob made him a coat of many colors. Jacob loved him more than all his sons. And Joseph was going, always going around talking about his dreams. And Joseph tells his brothers about his dreams of them bowing down to him, which actually comes to pass. And he sold off as a, slave, as a slave by his brothers who tricked their father into believing that he was ate by a wild beast. You now they take his coat and they, they rip it up and they deceive Jacob. And that's Jacob once again reaping what he sows because remember, he tricked his own father. But Jacob and his sons are not the most admirable characters in the Bible. The Bible shows you the true colors of its heroes. And as you can see in chapter 38, another one of Jacob's sons, Judah, he goes down a dark path. You see, the Bible shows you the ups and downs of its heroes. And in Genesis 38, it says, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he took her and he went in unto her. And the kids that he has from this marriage, they don't end up being good kids. You know, Judah went and took a daughter of a certain Canaanite. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would not have been cool with this because he's taken uh, someone to wife who would have been an idolater and you'll notice once again the process Judah saw a woman that he shouldn't have went after and then he took her and he let temptation get the best of him and that's what happens that's the process of sin you see something you want you see something you shouldn't have in your mind you start lusting or you start coveting that and then you take it. And in this marriage, the sons that Judah has, they turn out wicked as well. In Genesis 38, 7, And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. It's like this. Everyone is evil. Everyone is wicked. Everyone is bad, but some people are over much wicked as Solomon talks about. And I think that's the way Ur was. You know, Ecclesiastes 7.17 says, Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? You see, Ur could have lived out the rest of a long life and had kids and enjoyed the fruit of his labor and died in a good old age and full of days. But he chose the way of the transgressor. So now his brother, Ur's brother, Judah's other son, is, it, is supposed to take Ur's wife and have a child by her so that, just so that Ur can have a, a seed raised up to him. And in Genesis 38, 8 through 9, it says, And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground lest that he should give seed to his brother. So Onan is also wicked because of this act. And you see in verse 10, And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, and wherefore he slew him also. Now Judah, he has seen the death of both his sons. You know, Judah's outliving his own sons. He went and got with a person he should have never married, had wicked kids with her, and then now he's outlived both of the children. Certainly not saying that if you 
that if your children have died, that it's because of something you've done. But in Judah's case, uh, it didn't help matters. And in Genesis 39, Joseph is bought by Potiphar. Now you get back into Joseph. You had like a brief commercial break there with Genesis 38, but now you get back into Joseph. And that's pretty much what the rest of the book of Genesis is going to be about is Joseph, Jacob, his father, and then his brothers. And Genesis 39, 1 through 2, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So Joseph is down there, and he's, he's in Egypt, in Potiphar's house, and he gets framed by Potiphar's wife, and she makes it look like he's trying to rape her while Potiphar's out. And that should go to show you, you see, it's not really Joseph's fault. He didn't do anything wrong. But that goes to show you, never be left alone like that with the opposite sex if you can help it. Because you could end up framed. The next thing, the temptation was there. I'm sure there was somewhat of a temptation there for Joseph to actually go through with the proposal of Potiphar's wife who was really wanting to lie with Joseph at first, and she got offended, and so but she got offended because he wouldn't go through with the act with her, so she ends up framing him. So never be left alone like that with the opposite sex. You'll end up getting framed, you'll end up getting tempted, or at the least, people will just be talking about you. It's It goes along with staying away from the appearance of evil, protecting your testimony. Uh, don't even... Really, if you can help it, I wouldn't even ride around in the same car with just another woman that's not your wife or someone else's wife. That way, you know, you don't have to worry about them saying, oh, he's committing adultery. They must be going to some hotel together, even though you may not be. You just want to protect your testimony. Stay away from the appearance of evil. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, you're dating someone, you're going on a date with someone, something like that. I'm talking about if you're married, especially that person's married to somebody else as well, maybe you shouldn't do that. Protect your testimony. Don't put yourself in that temptation. Especially don't stay in the same house with somebody like that. But Ju Joseph, uh, Potiphar doesn't believe Joseph. He believes his wife, and then Joseph gets put in the slammer. And while he's there in Genesis 40, uh, the butler and the baker get put in the slammer as well. The butler and the baker get put into the prison with Joseph, and Joseph ends up interpreting their dreams. They both lay down at night. They have dreams. And in Genesis 40 and verse 8, and they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them. I pray you. So they tell him, and then Joseph's interpretation of their dreams turn out to be true, and the butler is restored, and the baker is hanged, just as Joseph predicts. And the awesome thing about this story is, you've got Joseph in prison, you've got the butler and the baker in prison. And what this pictures is, Joseph being a type of Jesus and then the butler and the baker picture the two dying thieves that Jesus is crucified with. And one dying thief, remember, believes on the Lord, says, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the other thief dies in his sins, doesn't believe on the Lord. And that's what you've got here. And this, uh, in Gen uh, chapter 40, one of these men Joseph interprets their dream, and this one of them is restored, but the other one is hanged. The one who's restored pictures the thief who believed in the Lord. The one who's hanged pictures the one who dies in his sins. So just like when Jesus was on the cross, 
One of the thieves believed on Jesus Christ and entered into life. The other rejected and entered into death. So that's a great picture there. Then in Genesis 41, you got Pharaoh's dream. But it turns out the butler, when he's restored, he forgot all about Joseph. He forgot all about Joseph interpreting his dream. He never told anyone about Joseph's miracle of interpreting their dreams. So now the Lord is going to cause Pharaoh to dream. And it says in Genesis 41, 8, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, after these dreams, you know, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof, and Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. You see, it's God that knows your thoughts and dreams. It's God that knows what is in the heart. And Pharaoh is looking toward the wisdom of the world for help. He's going after the magicians, thinking they're going to help him. But it's Joseph who can give the interpretation because he's going to go to God to get the ter interpretation. But the butler, you know, he tells Pharaoh about Joseph. So Joseph comes up to meet Pharaoh, and in Genesis 41, 16, And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me... God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You know, Paul even said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So if you're going to do anything truly good that has eternal value, it will have to be God doing it through you because it's not in you. It's not in your flesh. It's in the one that lives in you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph can give the interpretation only because... He's going to allow God to show him the interpretation, not because it's in him, in his flesh. You see, Joseph gives him the interpretation, and look what happens. In Genesis 41, 42 through 43, And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bowed the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. So Joseph, the greatest type of Jesus Christ in the Bible, he rides in the second chariot, just as Jesus is the second member of the Godhead, not not second in power. They're co-equal in power. They're, they're equal in power, but Jesus is the second member of the Godhead. They'll bow, they bow to the knee to Joseph, just as they will one day bow to Jesus Christ, Joseph is made ruler of Egypt, a type of the world. And when Jesus Christ comes back, he will rule the world. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah And he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. So Joseph's new name means savior of the world. Just like Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Joseph gets a Gentile bride, Asenath, just as Jesus has a Gentile, Gentile bride. And me and you are part of the bride of Christ, which is made up of mostly Gentiles. So you can see the picture. And then in Genesis forty-one forty-six, And Joseph was 30 years old. When he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. So Joseph is 30 years old when he begins to reign, just as Jesus is 30 when he started his earthly ministry. So the similarities are just over and over. Also in this chapter, Joseph has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Then in Genesis 42, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt, and there is a famine. And Jacob wants the boys to go to Egypt and get food. So in verse 2, he says, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither, and buy, uh, buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. So you can see how God's working this out supernaturally. You know, he's allowed Joseph to be sold into Egypt. Now there's a famine in the land, and Jacob's boys are going to have to go to Egypt and get corn from um, Joseph, the brother that they sold into this s situation. And 
Joseph's dreams are going to come true. His own brothers are going to bow down to him. So uh, Jacob tells his sons, Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. You see, do what you have to do to get food for your family. The brothers will now have to go get food from their little brother that they sold off. Joseph is going to be full aware that they are his brothers, but he's not going to make himself known to them. It says in Genesis 42, 8, And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. You see, this chapter ends up with Joseph wanting them to bring Benjamin, their youngest brother, to prove they aren't spies. Now, he knows they're not spies, but he wants to see his younger brother, Benjamin. Jacob, the father, is like, no, no chance. You're not bringing Benjamin. I've already lost Joseph. And Simeon ended up in prison in Egypt while they went, after they went. And he's like, if I lose Benjamin as well, it's going to kill me. And in Genesis 42, 38, it says, And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now that's Jacob talking. That's Jacob talking during a time of famine. You see, these years of famine are looking like trouble for Jacob. Not only has he gone through a famine, he's already lost his son that he's mourning over. He's worried about losing this youngest son, Benjamin. One of his sons is in prison. It's trouble for Jacob. No wonder this event here in the Bible pictures the time of Jacob's trouble, the future tribulation, great tribulation period that's yet to come where there's going to be a famine. It's going to be a time of trouble for Israel, which is Jacob. So this pictures the time of Jacob's trouble. So with no choice, in Genesis 43, Jacob has to let his, the brothers, his sons, take Benjamin to see Joseph in Egypt. And the brothers, brothers get down there to Egypt, but Joseph isn't satisfied with only seeing the brothers. So in Genesis 44, Joseph tricks his brothers, and he has his steward put the silver cup in Benjamin's sack to make it look like he stole it. So now the brothers are really in for it. Jacob let them take Benjamin, and now Benjamin is the one found with the silver cup in his sack. And it was said that who, whoever has the silver cup in his sack will be Joseph's servant forever. And you see, Jacob's going to die when he finds out. So, Judah steps up, gives an awesome speech greater than anything the movies ever came up with, and this causes Joseph to be moved with compassion. And in Genesis 45, Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. Up until this time, they just thought this was just some ruler in Egypt, right? They had no idea it was their brother that they had sold off years before. So he makes himself known, and in Genesis 45, 1, it says, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. Just like at the second coming, Jesus Christ is going to make himself known unto his brethren Israel. And they will accept him the second time, whereas they didn't accept him the first time. Just like the story with Joseph, his brothers didn't accept him the first time. They didn't like his dreams. They didn't like his coat of many colors. But now this second time, they're going to accept him. In Genesis 45, 2, And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. See, Egypt is a top of the world, and the world will hear Jesus Christ roaring and wailing when he comes back at the second coming. That's what this pictures, the second coming where Jesus Christ is going to make himself known to his brethren. In Genesis 46, Joseph's family comes to Egypt. And the Lord appears to Jacob in visions and tells him, it's okay to go to Egypt. So Joseph's whole, whole family comes to be with him. It says in Genesis 46, 31 through 34, And Joseph said to his brethren and to his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are coming to me. 
And the men are shepherds, for they tra their trade hath been to feed cattle, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass, when Pharaoh shall call you, and shall say, What is your occupation, that you shall say, Thy servants' trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. And Egypt is the top of the world. So if, the, so if shepherds are abomination unto the Egyptians, the picture is Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, is an abomination to the world. And that's why he said, Marvel not if the world hate you. You know, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The world hates Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ lives in you. And the more you act like a Christian, the more the world will hate you. Genesis 47, Jacob and the family settle in Egypt and meet Pharaoh. And in Genesis 47, 8 through 9, And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob was a hundred and thirty years old when he got to Egypt, and he said, Few and evil how the days of my life been. You see, you'll be fortunate to even live half of what Jacob lived up to this point. So if his life is few days up to this point, at that old of an age, then how long do you think you have? Think about it like this. If you're around 30, 15 years ago, you were just 15. And 15 years ago doesn't really seem that long ago. And the next 15 years will go by even faster than that 15 years, and you're going to be about 45. 15 more years after that will go by even faster, and you'll be 60. Then 15 more years later, you'll be 75. You see, that's getting up there. And most likely, if you're about 30 right now, you will only get that 15 years three more times. Just three more times. Think about how fast those last 15 years went. And you only get to do that about three more times, most likely. And on rare, rare occasions, maybe a fourth time. But 15 years ago, doesn't seem like that long ago at all to me. And they say time goes faster the older you get. So do something with your life while you're young, while you still have time. Do something with your life even if you're already old. Because you don't know, you could have another 15 years. But Joseph is getting old and full of days. He's met with his grandkids. He's been reunited with Joseph. And now, in chapter 48, Jacob blesses Ephraim and Manasseh. And Jacob tells Joseph about the promise that he got from the Lord, and he lets him know that he's claiming Ephraim and Manasseh as his own so that it passes on to them as well. And in chapter 49, Jacob gives an end-time sermon to his sons. And I think this is a really underrated chapter in the Bible. In Genesis 49, 1 through 2, it says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together. So he's getting all the sons together. He's going to do like a little last day sermon here. That I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Remember, Jacob is Israel. And Jacob jumps on Reuben. He tells him he's unstable as water. Because remember, Reuben went to bed with his own father's wife. And Jacob calls Simeon and Levi instruments of cruelty. Remember that they slaughtered a whole village of men after they tricked them into getting circumcised. But then he gets to Judah. And he says in Genesis 49, 8, Judah, thou art he whom by, uh, thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Jesus Christ comes from the tribe of Judah, and that is why he is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. In Revelation 5.5. 5. And the scepter won't depart from Judah. This is the tribe from which David comes. 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you got in chapter 50, Joseph buries his father Jacob. Joseph's brothers are still in fear and full of guilt over what they did to Joseph. And in Genesis 50, 18 through 21, it says, And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am I in the place of God. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. You see, they meant evil to sell Joseph, but God meant it for good. God knew there was a famine coming. God knew that Joseph would be in Egypt and be able to have food during this famine so that Abraham's sons, his seed, could come over there and their seed would be preserved this way. Joseph would be able to get them food. It says, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear you not. I will nourish you and your little ones and be comforted. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Just like when you sin against God, you get it under the blood by believing on Jesus Christ. God's not going to hold your sins over your head anymore because you're saved. And then after you're saved, you're still going to sin. You just confess it. And the blood gives you a daily cleansing, not to be saved, but to just to stay in fellowship. And you don't have to fear about paying for your sins anymore. Jesus paid it all. You don't have to live in guilt about it. What's done is done. It's paid for. It's settled. There's no need in living in guilt like Joseph's brothers were. And it saddened uh, Joseph to see that they were still living in guilt. But the soldiers meant evil when they crucified Jesus Christ. We mean evil when we sin. And that's what put Jesus on the cross was our sin. We meant some things for evil, but God meant it for good when he put Jesus on the cross to save much people alive. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land into the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So Genesis began with God creating a perfect creation, and it ended with a coffin. But this is the journey through Genesis. We went from Genesis 1 to Genesis 50. Now we're going to do an expedition through Exodus. Go through the whole book of Exodus. And we're just going to keep doing this through the entire Bible until I die or until the Lord comes back. We might get through it a couple more times. We might not even get through it another time. We might get through it ten more times. But you just want to keep going through the Bible. Keep refreshing your memory about each book of the Bible. At the same time doing, you know, more exhaustive studies, verse by verse. Uh, more topical studies. Or keep your Bible reading up. Keep your uh, memory verses up. And this is how you can get your Bible together. Do, uh, do something that shows you the big picture of the Bible uh, like this, and then get real in-depth with the Bible, looking for little nuggets of truth, looking at each word, looking at each verse, looking at each phrase. And that way you're building your Bible from the outside like we're doing here, but you're also working on the inside as well. And you keep doing this for about 10 years, you're really going to have your Bible put together.